starting that now. So we are recording live now. And we'll get started right on the dot since I have eight o'clock. Um, and that way we um, can be respectful of time and time changes. We appreciate you very much. In previous interviews, we understand you're not a morning person. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to read this real quick. Welcome to an exciting evening of with uh, Nguyen Fa Kwe Ma, poet, author, um, and who is joining us from Jakarta, Indonesia. Is that correct? Is that? Okay. Yes. I, I yes. knew you split your time between Vietnam and, and Indonesia. Um, my name is Chris Baker. I am the adult services librarian here at the New Bern Craven County Public Library, and I will be moderating the discussion. Um, before we get started, uh, we are recording this live conversation uh, for use on the Craven County Regional Library social media and media uh, websites. Anyone not wishing to have their image on screen tonight or in the future uh, showing may turn their uh, screens off at this or any other time. Uh, we have also muted everyone on this call and asked that if you have questions to please uh, raise your hand uh, using the feature on your screen. Uh, we have a few prepared questions uh, and then we'll open the floor to questions after. Feel free to type in questions in the chat and we will work those into the conversation as well. Oh, wow, we're getting lots of folks joining as we come on. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, sure. for having me. And um, I would like to thank uh, Miss um, Cassandra Hansaka, the branch manager of the New Bern uh, Graven County Public Library for organizing this event. Thank you so much for uh, to everyone for joining us uh, today. And it's morning my time. It's eight <laughs> o'clock here in the morning, but it's evening your time. So uh, what a great difference that we have and what a world we have at the moment. You know, the borders are closed. We cannot travel. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to be with you today. Um, actually, I used to work as a librarian at the um, international uh, School, uh, American International School of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I was just telling Chris before that how I love to be surrounded by books and readers. And it's my great honor to be here today and talk to Chris, who's like a book uh, a specialist. So what an honor. Thank you. Sure, sure. Oh, we're getting more folks. Welcome, everyone. Um, I was going to read an introduction uh, just to let you, to let uh, the folks that are joining us know who, who and, and what you are. Uh, you were born in a small village in North Vietnam in 1973. Uh, you migrated with your family to the Mekong Delta uh, in South Vietnam when you were six. Um, you got to, uh, because of your academic achievements in 1993, you received a scholarship in, in Australia uh, from the Australian government to study in Australia for four years. Uh, upon returning to uh, Vietnam, Kwe Ma worked for several international organizations, including the United Nations agencies, to foster Vietnam's sustainable development. We're going to, I've got a question about that here in a second. Uh, Kwe Ma's main research area is the long-lasting impact of wars. She has worked extensively with veterans and war victims. She has a PhD in creative writing from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom uh, and is an honorary fellow in writing of the Hong Kong Baptist University. This is, uh, we're excited to mention this. Uh, you, uh, Kwe Ma has most uh, recently honored as the 2020 Liana Award Fellowship in Fiction. Uh, the fellowship recognizes writers Happy whose work here. is uh, exceptional quality. She has been awarded the poetry of the the poet of the year uh, for the uh, Sandra has joined the meeting. We, um, we're getting some. Uh, let's see where did I where did I go? Uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books. In the review of Kwe Ma's The Secret of Wan Son, uh, calls her one of Vietnam's foremost contemporary poets. Uh, and that, that will count as the introduction. 
Uh, we could keep talking, but we'll we'll get into the questions. Um, one of the things that um, we noticed and we we really appreciated in the book and uh, was how the Vietnamese culture has such a respect for its elders. Um, and can can you talk a little bit about just that? Um, it, it comes up in the book that you call. Uh, elders, auntie or uncle or grandma or mother. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, that was one of the things that we appreciated the most, but we also had some questions about. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So um, actually, um, you know, uh, the, the way we address another person shows respect. So for example, uh, if I were to talk to you in Vietnamese, I have to call you anh, brother. Uh, to show respect to you. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the title a person assumes depending on the age. So if I go shopping in Vietnam, I know exactly how old I am because before I was called M, you know, like young. Uh, oh, first, when I was very little, people called me uh, Chao Nis. Okay, they call me knees, the, the sellers, they would call me knees, Chao. And then when I grew up a little bit, I became uh, younger sister M, and when I grew older, they call me J, meaning uh, older sister. And now, if I go shopping, people call me Go, Auntie, <laughs> Auntie. Okay. And when I go, you know, in a few years, I will be called back, you know, elder Auntie. Or oh, all right. Um. Well, we'll we'll pick up. Uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, are you are you still there? We'll make sure that you're. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um. So the the question was, um, it would be very easy uh, to hold strong feelings um, towards Americans and American culture, um, but there's no trace of that in your book. Um, where does that come from? From your in your own experience. Oh, you know, it took me a, a lifetime to understand stories from the other side. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, you know, I was brought up inside Vietnam and the first time that I left Vietnam to, to do my studies was when I was 20 years old. I was nearly 20 years old. I was 19 at that time. And for me, um, I still had a lot of resentment against American soldiers. Um, and I remember the first time I came to the States in, um, I think, 1998. Um, I visited Washington, D.C. with my husband, and he took me to the Vietnam uh, War Veteran Memorial. And I refused to, to go in. And I told him, you know, um, um, I, I told him, you know, I don't want to go in and honor those who contributed regardless of how small to to the death of three million people in Vietnam. I, I couldn't do that. And I, I felt really angry and I stood outside for half an hour and I think I was crying with anger. And then um, half an hour later, my husband went out and he, he took my hand and he said, if you don't go in, you are going to regret it because this is so significant. And I went in and and you know, the first thing I saw was like letters on the foot of the wall, letters of children of these these veterans, these these fallen soldiers who had written to their fathers. And I read those letters and I, I cried. And I think it was the first time that I realized the humanity of the other side and and how much the American side american people have suffered from this war you know and after that trip i began to read more literature written by vietnam war veterans and um, literature written about their family members and i just realized that like vietnam america was torn by this war like Vietnam, there are still so many uh, people who are living with the trauma from the Vietnam War. And, and like Vietnam, there's still so much healing and re recon reconciliation to be done. So, so that's why, you know, like the, 
the story of how uh, Huang read um, a book from America, uh, you know, a translated mm -hmm. book. It mm -hmm. comes from a real life story because I, a few years after my return from from my first American visit, I started to translate literature by American veterans so that the Vietnamese people know about the humanity of the other side because, you know, in any war, uh, the enemy was dehumanized. You know, the American soldiers were, were you know, were told to Vietnamese people like they were monsters, you know, like they, they, they didn't have any feelings for other people. And, and my conversations with veterans of the war of both sides, all sides, show that this was wrong. And, you know, a, a lot of American uh, soldiers who fought in the Vietnam War had no choice but to fight. And also they come, you know, most of the soldiers, a lot of soldiers were black Americans or Americans who could not afford to go to university uh, you know who, you know who were very disadvantaged, and they they had to go to Vietnam, and and so the you know so I translated one of um, the the essay of the veteran Larry Heinemann, who wrote uh, about his experience in the war and how, you know how he met later on a professor of Vietnamese literature, um, who translated. American literature for Vietnamese soldiers to read so that they could read into the minds of the Americans so that they could fight in the war better. So, you know, in translating this essay, I got an idea that I let Huang read a book of, um, you know, um, translated uh, literature from America so that she could change her viewpoint about American people. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, um, I, I think like Hung said in the book, if all of us read books from our other culture, there would be no war on earth because we see other people not as enemy but as human beings who who are just like us. That that speaks. That very much speaks. Um, even just reading a book about. Uh, as an American, you read a book about an American, or as a Vietnamese, you read a book about a, a, a fellow Vietnamese. It changes your perspective. Um, well, you mentioned you mentioned other Vietnam uh, uh, Vietnamese writers and and works of the Vietnam War, and we were talking a little bit about this before. Who do you recommend for say someone um, who is just starting out in reading about the Vietnam War, or just starting out? uh to 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 hear that other side who do you who do you recommend besides besides this this is a fantastic place to start but where, where else thank you you know um uh, bounding bounding the sorrow of war is is a great um sorry i need to put something hang on a second sorry After so this computer has much better um, connection. So I'm going to type in the chat box. Uh, um, okay. I'm going to type in the chat box in some title because um, the name can be um, um, can be difficult. So the first book that I recommend is Bounding the Sorrow of War. So it's written by a northern Vietnamese soldier who um, who who was the first soldier from north the northern Vietnamese army from the communist side to highlight the horror of war and to highlight the trauma and PTSD suffered by by civilians and by soldiers. What's unique about this book is that the official viewpoint of the Vietnamese government is that there's no sorrow uh, concerning the war because we won it. So it's victorious, it's righteous. So there's no sorrow. So the book was actually banned in Vietnam for quite some years and now, and they made, uh, the author changed the title of the book to The Fate of Love because they said no sorrow. But now, uh, because the book has, is really like popular so they al allow the name to uh, to be reverted to the original name the sorrow of war uh, another book um 
um, um, dạng ngân, uh, the insignificant, uh, the insignificant family, insignificant family. Um, so this uh, dạng ngân, so bounding rights from the point of view of a northern Vietnamese soldier, and dạng ngân rights from the point of view of a civilian you know uh, from south vietnam yeah so so these books uh, um, you know have both uh, both of these books have two two viewpoints because vietnam was divided into north and south vietnam during the war or um, um there's so many other books um i can i also will put into the link um of um you know like um recently i worked with the instagrammer to um um to put together a list of recommended reading um of vietnamese literature because you know um i think um hollywood has used vietnam and vietnamese people too much as as uh you know um um background for the american stories you know mm -hmm. we we are often seen as as victims as voiceless and I, I i think we vietnamese people need space to tell our own stories so so that's why i worked uh, with this instagrammer to put together this uh, this list of um of recommended readings so i'm going to share it on um, on the chat um but i just want to say that you know there's so much um you know like uh, um, so there are two types of literature on this list. The, uh, those written by Vietnamese uh, from inside Vietnam, you know, like I'm a Vietnamese national. Um, so I'm the first person uh, who write in English, but um, there have been wonderful um, stories that are, have been translated. For example, for those who read poetry, um you know so i just shared the list on um, on instagram of uh, this instagrammer who put together with my help so we have you know from poetry from children from fiction from to non-fiction so you can look at the review there and there's so much to choose from depending on your taste so for example if you like epic stories you if you have like if you love poetry and uh, an epic uh, book of poetry i would recommend nguyễn du's um the um, chuyện kiều the tale of kiều so this book is like the bible for all vietnamese it's written in 3,000 more than 3,400 verses. Um, so only poetry it tells the life of Kiều uh, from six eight Vietnamese po poetic form. So it rhymes perfectly. So it's called a uh, chuyện Nguyễn Du. I will highlight it. Um, the tale of Kiều. So um, you know this book we we use it to do our fortune telling. We use it to sing babies to sleep. Uh, yeah, there are people who learn the this whole book by heart. So um, I interviewed someone who had to evacuate from Hanoi during the American bombs, and she said uh, she was only twelve years old. She said every night she read from her memory, um, you know, um, a part of the tale of Gil to her baby sister, so the baby sister could fall asleep. So in Vietnamese, we have um, we have um, um, you know um, a Vietnamese uh, poet um, Phùng Quán who said, "Có những phút ngã lòng tôi vị câu thơ và đứng dậy. During the moments of despair, I hold the bird of poetry uh, to pull myself up." So you know, um, yeah, poetry is really the the pillar of the vietnamese life well your book is so poetic it, it reads there were times where i i caught myself having to remind myself that i was listening there was a there was something more to this it this section fit into a greater story so i i can see how that uh and in in your poetry uh is phenomenal we we read some uh 
and it's very easy to see how for you how hard was it to take having written poetry and stretch that into a, a longer narrative as you wrote or did you was that a, an easy process um i i i think i wrote it um i met you know i didn't plan for the plotting of of this book first so i didn't plot it i didn't know what would happen to the characters i just wrote it as they told me and of course there was a lot of editing and in the middle of the book i started to do chapter per chapter synopsis um, i think the poetry came in later because as a poet i wanted the language to be beautiful to be mm -hmm. meaningful to be new, to be poetic so i by i polished it a lot and i sneak poetry in I'm, I was cheating because, you know, uh, because uh, it was, you know, I, because um, few people read poetry nowadays. So I just wanted the chance to share some of my passion for poetry and the way we write poetry in, in you know, in Vietnamese tradition. And I think even in our daily life, you know, poetry, it is infused in our daily conversation through proverbs and, and through saying. Well, I'm going to open it up. We've got a few more minutes. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type in the uh, chat box to the side. If you're joining us by phone, uh, feel free to, I believe I have unmuted everyone. Um, and if you have, I think I've unmuted everyone. So if you've got any questions, feel free. Uh, we'll let everybody take a chance to unmute and wait to see yeah I'm, I'm sorry we may have lost some, some oh sorry go ahead please oh no no please there's uh, some someone who was speaking please continue sorry um i don't let's see I've unmuted everyone. Okay, so you you're available. Anyone who would like is able to unmute themselves. Gosh, what have I done? Did you did you notice someone that was? Yes, yes. There, there was someone. There was someone who was speaking. Anyway, so um, so I I, I think we may have lost some um, people because I had to log out. Um, but I couldn't. I my apologies because I couldn't really hear you with the. So I had to to try and go in again. Yes. Okay. Well, hmm. Yeah, so so I, I can, if there's no question, I could uh, share with you my next uh, writing project. Oh, um, please, so, please do. Okay. Oh, yes, there's someone online. <laughs> So my my next project is uh, is also um, is also based on stories on real life stories. My interview with the um, American children of um, Vietnamese American, you know, who were born into the war, children of American soldiers. Oh wow! So there are like a hundred thousand of them who were born, and many were abandoned during the war and many haven't been able to find their parents so i document their their journey through life and also you know the decisions of their parents why some of them had to abandon their kids so yeah so so it's, it's also an emo emotional project but i feel it's really important because very few people know about americans and um yeah and, and 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 i think the search for family members are always you know very emotional and um there's a lot of there are a lot of ethical issues
Can you hear me, Chris? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, we, we got you back. Well? Tara, good, uh, do you have a question for me? Thank you for your comment. You can also type it in the chat box if you have comments and you can't, uh, you don't have access to voice. So it took me uh, seven years to, to write this novel. Um, you know, there were moments I felt I was crazy <laughs> for writing this in my second language. Uh, but it was, um, you know, there were so many nights that I couldn't sleep. Um, because the it was the characters who, who told me get up because our stories can't sleep. Um, so my husband said, "Oh, this story is going to this novel is going to kill you because you know you 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 don't take holiday, you don't sleep enough, you don't eat enough." But I think that's 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 me. Whenever I'm into a book, you know, I've written a lot of books, and every book has given me white hair <laughs> and <laughs> made me older but i think it's all worth it i think i think the feedback from readers have been amazing and and i'm really i'm really grateful for the chance to speak with you today and to share stories from vietnam oh uh, tara said uh, what research do you do for the book yeah so um and that's a great question. Thank you so much, Tara. So this uh, this book was born of uh, my out of my interviews with hundreds of other people. I mean, I think I researched for this book all my life, you know, because I grew up in a small village in the north of Vietnam, and you see my village, you know, in in the novel because the village life I could always I could only describe it be, because I lived there, I grew up there, and I grew up in the rural area in the south of Vietnam. So uh, I talked to a lot of people and I saw how v how Vietnam was divided by the war and how many families, uh, you know, had members who fought against each other. So, um, so I, you know, through my work, I, I talked to a lot of people. So, so this novel was born out of, you know, stories told on the rice fields, in village temples, in kitchens, because I love to go into people's home and, cope with them you know my my parents are quite acquaintances um you know i visit them i love elderly people of vietnam because they hold inside of them history and they haven't been able to share that history because a lot of things are politically sensitive like the land reform so people are afraid to speak about it and um you know like so so i I didn't want those stories to be forgotten. So, um, yeah, so I complemented the real life oral stories with my research. So I visited a lot of museums uh, and former battlefields in Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. I traveled to Laos by car and traveled through Cambodia by car. Um, also, I visited a lot of uh, museums in Australia, you know, um, uh, the United States. I went into uh, archives and I read a lot of books, fiction and nonfiction. I also uh, researched into books on uh, literary criticism, you know, to know how to write against colonialization, how to write, to how to um, be aware of representation issues because like um, there, there are a lot of, you know, um, in Vietnam war fiction, um, Vietnamese women are normally seen as victims, as prostitutes, as those absent of trauma, absent of agency, absent of power, who need to rely on men to rescue them, you know. So when, when I read uh, literary criticism, I am aware of these representation issues so that I know how to present my characters in, in a more complex way, how to put, you know, Vietnamese people on the equal level with, with readers around the world. So, so that, you know, that's why I became braver, more brave to infuse Vietnamese language into the book, you know. So my book, so 
it's, it's published with all the tonal marks, you know, uh, the Vietnamese tonal marks. And it's a brave decision by my editor because my name is very long and normally people don't remember it. But I wanted the book to be authentic, you know. I, I, I didn't want to change my language and my culture to fit the ears and eyes of the and eyes of the Western reader. Thank you, Sarah, uh, Tara, for the great question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, did, uh, Tara joined us for the book club, and we she so she was a part of that discussion of just the perspective and how grateful we were to to have that change. Uh, but then it, it's it did it sounded so familiar. You mentioned in in the the question about how this book is placeless and timeless, and that it could be. But there were so many. If you're a study of American a student of American history. That book could have been written about our own civil war. You mentioned people fighting against brothers and sisters. It's just, it's it's powerful, and that speaks it speaks across time, uh, which makes that so interesting and such a it's such a well done, uh, a well done book uh, to be able to do that. And you did that so well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have another question. Yes. Hi. Peter. You. I, I turn it on because it's kind of a long question. <laughs> you spoke earlier about the way you tell the stories and it being circular, and I didn't hear all of your answer. When you wrote it, mm. did you just start at the beginning and go through, like, Grandma, you know, back and forth, just like we, the way we read it? Yes, and yes. Yes, I, I, I wrote it like that because I wanted to... Uh, have interaction uh, between grandma and Huang. I want mm -hmm. them to alternate the story because I feel like, you know, it's, it's the tradition of oral storytelling that we share each other's story. And uh, my intention is for their story to meet towards the end. So for their story to meet at the chapter before, be, at uh, chapter about Uncle Ming. Mm -hmm. found Uncle Ming. So, um, so, you know, in the original manuscript before it was published, I, I had shorter chapter, um, you know, so, so the chapter was like half of what it is now. But then in the end, when I worked with my editor, uh, she didn't want to, uh, to lose too much of the momentum in the storytelling. So she said, um, maybe we, sh we merge some chapters so that they are longer. Um, there's still alternation, but there should be it should be longer. So that's what I did. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thanks for reading the book and for, for discussing it in the book club. So if, uh, I, I think Chris is recording our conversation. So after, mm -hmm. uh, once the recording is available, you could send it. Uh, if you could share it with book club members, that'd be amazing. Thank you. We will. We will put this out. Um, does anybody else? Anybody else have any questions? Well, I'll ask this as a closing question. This is a question that I ask in our, our uh, book club is who who do you recommend this book to? Oh, I, I would recommend this book to anyone who wants to travel to Vietnam. It is a very cheap uh, flight ticket <laughs> nowadays, you know. Um, yeah, you can get to know the architecture, the culture, the food, meet the people, have them guide you through Vietnam and Vietnamese history. Uh, yeah, so, and also any reader who wants to, to, you know, to know, um, to read something outside the United States or outside their own culture, people who who want to support, uh, you know, um, voices which are, um, you know, voices from places which are not so well known yet. Vietnam 
is not on the world literary literary map because so little of our literature is translated our language is really complex and unfortunately we don't have a good team of translators in vietnam so um yeah so so i think for anyone who who likes historical fiction who wants to travel with books who want to enjoy a good story and get to know other people from other culture yeah and um you know i've been grateful but i i wrote this book for vietnamese people uh, first and foremost um because we need a lot of healing and a lot of reconciliation um you know there has been a lot a lot more re you know there has been progress uh, in terms of reconciliation among vietnamese and americans but inside our community that reconciliation is difficult because you know the community inside and outside Vietnam are still very much divided. So this book has be, has enabled me to talk with with you know Vietnamese people scattered around the world, and we share our stories and and and, and some of the younger generation, um, you know, people who who are of my age or younger have told me this book enabled them to talk to their their parents. Uh, because their parents are very traumatized. Their parents right. think that their, their children don't understand enough to know the history, how complex it is. And, you know, but on the other, but in fact, these young people are interested, but they didn't know what questions to ask. So I have, um, I have had cases where the whole family read this book together. All the younger people read the book and ask their parents what happened to their family. So they share their conversations with me, and uh, it has been really meaningful um, to to kind of listen to what they went through. And you know, like I think this book, um, I have received hundreds of emails from veterans or from who fought in Vietnam, who told me how much this book has helped them and their family members. Um, there have been many children of American veterans who reached out to me as well. And it, it is really, really moving because I I wrote this book to bring people together to promote reconciliation. And I hope it will happen more and as it reaches more people. Well, it certainly took, it took me and it took the folks that, that read the book uh, in our discussion, it took us there. Um, we, it was heartfelt when we discussed that. Uh, it was very much, uh, very much uh, felt uh, as we read that we we appreciated your your words and appreciated your perspective um, very very much so it's very moving um, and at times we 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 had to let it cool we could start talking about the book but then just had to say we've got to process this from each other's points of view um, and had to let it wait so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, thank you for your perspective. I, I will be respectful of your time. Um, and I'll, I'll ask one more time. Does anybody else have any questions? I, I know we've um, you've got a day to get started uh, and we are winding our day down. Um, but I wanted to be respectful of anybody else's questions. Oh, is that that's your website? Is that not that you dropped there into the chat? So I just uh, shared the link to my newsletter. So um, this this newsletter, I, um, I I will um, share a few things about you know um, my writing process, or I, I think I will write it maybe once or twice a year with my updates, including updates about my next book. And my reading recommendations and so on. So if you like, you could oh, wow. um, you subscribe to it. Um, oh, yeah. we love. I love so, a good recommendation. Thank you, Tara. I would love you to subscribe to the newsletter as well. I would love to keep in touch. Thank you for reading the book and for your compassion towards Vietnam. Thank you. Well, I think. Being that, 
Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you from from the bottom of our hearts. We've appreciated the fact that you've uh, spoken and taken your time and spoken with us. Um, so we will conclude by saying thank you again and uh, please be safe and we look forward to reading your works in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Chris and uh, everyone for uh, for joining us today. And um, yeah, I look, stay safe and have a great holiday season and see you when I, I, I need to go there. to be Sure, the you're welcome. Any, any time, as soon as it's safe, you're welcome anytime. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Bye, Chris. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.